Good morning and welcome to Talbot Park Baptist Church. Uh, this is our seventh week of worshiping in this way together. Hard to believe, but I am glad that you are joining us. And if you need a reminder of what day of the week it is because you've lost track of all time, it's Sunday. And we are glad to be joined in this time of worship. We welcome all of you wherever you may be and invite you to participate in this time of worship with us together. Glorious, I 
Loving Father, this is a time for celebration because we are in your presence. And we come to you this morning celebrating the gift of a new day with all its possibilities before us. We come to you this morning celebrating the gift of life, which we receive anew with every breath we take. We come to you this morning celebrating the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. It is his love for us that makes our celebration possible. Today, we thank you for that love, and for the grace we feel through him. God, we are painfully aware that we are not always deserving of such grace. And we thank you for being a God who forgives us, who helps us back to our feet when we fall. This morning, we ask that you remind us of our true identity when we forget, that you will wash away the sin and the doubts that cloud our vision and allow us to see ourselves for who we really are, your children, made in your image. We need a reminder that we are not defined by the things we own or what others think about us, but by our relationship to you. Despite all our faults, you have made us, you have declared us to be very good. Today we need to hear that word of hope and affirmation. God of all healing, we pray also this morning for those we know of in need of help and comfort. We pray for those who are affected by COVID-19, both here in our community and around the world. In the midst of the suffering and the death and the frustration at not being able to do what we want, help us to find peace. All of us have needs this morning, and we lift those needs up to you right now. God, even though we are not gathered in person, we are still gathered by your spirit as the body of Christ. We ask a special prayer this morning for Talbot Park Baptist Church. We are grateful for the generosity and the love of her people. and We trust you to show us the way forward. We thank you for your faithful guidance so far. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And we ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
Remember me when the little children come to me with songs. Remember me when they're old enough to teach, old enough to preach, old enough to eat. First Peter chapter 1 verses 17 through 23 since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear for you know that it was not with perishable things <coughs> such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God, the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. 
during this Easter season, we are thinking together about what it means to be disciples. And I'm preaching a series of sermons called Discipleship 101. This morning, our text is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and I will begin reading in verse 13. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, for their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them, breaking of the bread. The word of God for the people of God. Dramatic irony occurs when the readers of a story know something the characters don't know. We have a classic example in this resurrection story from Luke. Sometime earlier that morning, the women had discovered the empty tomb, but now it's Easter Sunday afternoon, and we get this scene of two disciples walking from Jerusalem to their home village of Emmaus, when all of a sudden Jesus appears and starts walking along beside them. Sounds great, except that Cleopas and his friend have no idea who it is. We know it's Jesus, but they don't know. Hence the dramatic irony. And Luke, being the good storyteller that he is, allows this irony to build up over time. So Cleopas ask Jesus, have you heard about all the things that have been happening in Jerusalem? Jesus, instead of immediately revealing himself, which would make sense, plays dumb. He says, what things? This reminds me of what happens in my household all the time. Just this past week, I went into my closet, found a big bottle of water sitting on top of my dresser, and I asked Amos and Ellie, who put this here? And they said, what bottle? So in addition to the irony, there is also a comedic element to this story. I'm sure that many of you in here have seen the movie 
Some Like It Hot with Jack Lemmon, Tony Curtis. It is ranked by the American Film Institute as the funniest comedy of all time. And throughout that film, those two men hide out from gangsters by pretending to be members of a women's jazz band. We, the audience, know who they really are, but the rest of the characters don't find out until much later, which leads to plenty of hijinks along the way. There's a similar dynamic at work in this story. It's told as a farce. It's not just that Cleopas and his friend fail to recognize Jesus, it's that Jesus plays along with the joke. I always imagine Jesus in this story wearing a Groucho Marx uh, nose and mustache to disguise himself, and Jesus seems to really enjoy hearing Cleopas telling him about what happened when he knows full well. This, this is supposed to be funny. Don't let anyone ever tell you that the Bible isn't funny. This is good stuff. Jesus, fresh out of the grave, is hearing about his own crucifixion, his own resurrection from these two bumbling disciples. This is supposed to make us laugh. But it's also supposed to make us wonder how many times Jesus is right there beside us and we fail to see him. I think that's one of the weaknesses of modern Christianity. You and I in the church today have a lot of sermons and Sunday school lessons, and we like that stuff because we're big on explanations. We, we like when someone tells us what the Bible means. We take comfort in that knowledge. But explaining Jesus is different than experiencing Jesus. I think that's one of the key themes in this story. Even after Jesus jumps in and starts telling these two about how the scriptures foretold his death and resurrection, they still don't get it. The explanations fall short to the point where Jesus is getting ready to just keep on walking and these two would never have realized that the risen Lord was there in their midst. One thing makes the difference. When they get back to their village, Cleopas and his friend invite Jesus in for a bite to eat. And it is there, sitting around the table, that their eyes are opened, and these two disciples suddenly realize who has been with them the whole time. Last week, I talked about the story from the empty tomb where Mary Magdalene mistakes Jesus for the gardener. And not until she hears Jesus speak her name does she know who it is. In this story, it's not Jesus' voice who gives him away. This time, the disciples recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Sharing a meal reveals Jesus to us in a way that nothing else can. Even when we fail to see him sitting right there in front of us, even when those religious explanations go by the wayside, you and I can still meet Jesus around the table. And that shouldn't surprise us. After all, one of the most important observances as Christians is the Lord's Supper. And here in this story from Luke, we hear echoes of that language we use in communion. Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, gives it to the others. That's not a coincidence. Luke roots this resurrection appearance in the liturgy of the church. And by doing so, he is telling us that every time you and I break bread together in this way, we too are capable of meeting the risen Christ. I think that's something you and I sometimes undervalue. It's a Baptist thing. Baptists are just not very good at sacraments. I have a dear Episcopalian friend who often comes to join us for worship here at Talbot Park, and she loves the music, loves the people, even likes my sermons most of the time, but the one thing she misses the most when she comes to worship at Talbot Park is taking communion. While all that other stuff may be wonderful, that there is something about partaking in the Lord's Supper that makes Christ present to us in a way that the words and the prayers and the music just don't accomplish alone. Author N.T. Wright tells us 
that when Jesus attempted to explain his upcoming death to his disciples, he didn't give them a theory. He left them with a meal. I think that's a helpful reminder for us. Yes, sermons are good. Music is good. Sunday school lessons are good. But nothing can replace coming around the Lord's table to break bread together. Because when you and I take communion, it's not about having the right answers. It's not about coming up with the perfect explanations. It is about a tangible, incarnational experience. It's something that engages us, our bodies and souls, in a completely different way. I think it's what the psalmist knew when he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's the physicality of it that makes Jesus real to us in a powerful way. But it's not just the Lord's Supper. I think what happens with Cleopas and his friend over dinner in Emmaus also reveals the extent to which Jesus is present with us in everyday moments of our lives. Remember that these two guys didn't know it was Jesus. They just thought they were extending hospitality to this random stranger who had happened to join them along the road, and that's the gag. Jesus doesn't just show up for us when we're gathered around the altar table having communion in a church building. Jesus is also there with us when we are breaking bread together at home. Scholar John Dominique Crossan believes that this is what actually makes Jesus distinct from almost every other teacher that was around at that same time. There were lots of rabbis, lots of would-be messiahs roaming around first century Judea who were teaching and preaching and baptizing, and even performing miracles. But what makes Jesus special, according to Crossan, is how he eats. In the Gospels, Jesus is eating all the time. In fact, that becomes one of the main criticisms that the scribes and the Pharisees accuse Jesus of. They say at least John the Baptist and his disciples have the decency to fast and to act holy. But you and your disciples are a bunch of pigs, gluttons. You're always eating and drinking. It is intended as an insult, but of course, Jesus says, that's the whole point. Jesus says, that is why I have come to feed those who are hungry. And of course, it's not just that Jesus is eating, it's who he's eating with. Fishermen, tax collectors, prostitutes, rich people, and poor people. Sometimes Jesus is having a picnic among thousands on a hillside. Sometimes he's partying at a wedding. Sometimes he's sitting around a table with just a few chosen disciples. But to cross him, that willingness to eat with anyone is the best indicator of what Jesus is trying to teach us. Crossan calls it open commensality, which is just a fancy way of saying that around Jesus's table, everybody is welcome. Not just the saints, not just the religious elites, but the sinners too. If you and I want to know what God's kingdom looks like, the best place to start is by gathering around the table. That's good news. Because while Baptists may be lousy at sacraments, we are experts when it comes to eating. Some of us have devoted many years of our lives in uh, developing this practice. And I say that only half jokingly because I do think that what we Baptists often refer to as fellowship is a big part of what it means to be disciples of Jesus. Remember, that's what we're talking about during this Easter season, discipleship. And one of our working definitions of a disciple is a person who does what Jesus does. So what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus eats a lot. <laughs> so maybe you and I should eat a lot. And remember, not just that we eat, it's who we're eating with. I like a, a good potluck as much as the next Baptist. Sometimes I think our definition of fellowship is too narrow. We enjoy eating with fellow church members, going out to eat dinner with some of friends, or maybe gathering around the table with our family. But breaking bread as disciples of Christ 
asks something more of us. It asks us to extend the invitation to those we don't like, or even to those who are socially unacceptable. You know, I find it fascinating that in times of economic hardship, the federal government always cuts the food assistance programs first. Almost always, that's what happens. And I hear lots of folks grumbling because they believe that there are people who are taking advantage of the system to get something that uh, they don't deserve. Oh, they're on welfare and I've worked hard for what I have. Those people are, are getting something for nothing. Here's the thing. Jesus doesn't call us to feed those who deserve it. Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Whether we think they deserve it is beside the point. Breaking the bread of Christ is not just for the prim, the proper people of the church. It's also for the misfits, for the deadbeats, for the freeloaders, and the welfare queens. If you and I really want to do what Jesus does, we got to start by making a place for everyone at the table. There's a story of St. Francis, who was visiting a monastery one day, and the person in charge told him that two thieves had come in and stolen all the bread supplies for the entire monastery, and St. Francis said, I must apprehend them. And so he set off running after these two men and chased them down. And when he finally found them, Francis was carrying under one arm a loaf of bread and under the other arm a bottle of wine. And he told the two thieves, you must be hungry. Take this and eat it. And when you've had your fill, come back with me to where there's more. And the story says that after these two thieves recovered from their astonishment, they went back with Francis to become monks and followers of Jesus. When you and I are willing to break bread with strangers, you never know who might show up. That's what Cleopas and his friend discovered on that evening in Emmaus. Not in a church, not while they were praying, but around the table, that's where they found Jesus. The same thing can happen with us. Actually, this is a wonderful time for us to talk about breaking bread as disciples of Jesus, because even though we are separated in our own homes and we're not able to go out and eat like we once could, it turns out that uh, bread making has become a very popular thing to do during this time of coronavirus. I don't know if you realize this, but this has been trending. So if you look at Instagram or on social media, there's lots of posts of people who have been baking, making their own bread. During this time of crisis, it seems that making, kneading, smelling, eating these fresh homemade loaves of bread provide comfort to the point where in some parts of our country right now, there is actually a shortage of yeast. And I got to thinking, maybe that's the problem all the time. Maybe we as disciples of Christ are failing in our task to add yeast and leaven to the world. Not because there's a shortage of sermons and Sunday school lessons and explanations. No, we have plenty of those. Maybe, the reason we fail to see Jesus around us is due to an actual shortage of yeast. Maybe you and I don't take seriously enough the call to break bread together in the ways that Jesus has modeled for us. The very last thing that Jesus did before he went to the cross was to share a meal with his disciples. According to Luke, it's also the first thing he does after he's resurrected. So maybe this is more than just a symbol. This is a central part of what it means for us to experience Christ together. Let's taste and see for ourselves. Amen. Let's pray together. Loving God, we are grateful this morning that you come to us not just through 
the words we offer, not just through our sermons and our prayers and the music, not just through those explanations and answers we devise to explain who you are, but that you are present to us in the most basic ways, in the ways that we take for granted from day to day, the food that we eat. God, we are grateful for this meal, for this Lord's Supper, for what it represents to us, not just in this time of worship, but from day to day as we find you present with us, around us, in our daily bread. And this morning, as we gather around this table, we pray that once again, we will experience the risen Christ in a way that can compare with nothing else, that our eyes will be opened, that we will see who you really are. In your name we pray. Amen. I hope you have your own elements of communion available and ready for you there at home, wherever you may be. And we remember that this is not an invitation to join the table of Aaron or the table of Talbot Park Baptist Church, but that in the true spirit of Jesus, everyone is invited to participate in this meal because we all need to be fed. We all need to experience the love and grace of Jesus Christ that we find when we gather together and break bread in this way. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it. Jesus told his disciples, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat.
Just as Jesus shared the bread with his disciples, he also shared the cup. And Jesus said, this cup is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink.
thank you again for joining us during this time of worship and remind you that we continue to meet for Zoom every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. We'll be sending out another invitation tomorrow in the email and an email reminder again on Wednesday, but we'd love to have as many people as possible join us for that. We spend a little time catching up with each other and in prayer, and then we talk a little bit about the past week's sermon together, and it's been a good way for us to at least see each other's faces during this time of coronavirus. Uh, another reminder that we are collecting food uh, for the food bank, uh, and we have a bin set up by the Granby Street entrance as you come into the church uh, to place items there. In the messenger, there was a list of some specific items that the food bank is really in need of during this time. We're also planning, uh, not this coming week, but probably week after next, uh, to volunteer for some shifts at the food bank. They are now taking back volunteers to help with uh, several different things. And so you'll be hearing more information about that when we get those details out. And now having tasted for ourselves, let's go out to make Christ known by adding yeast to our world. Amen.